undeniable, part three. We've been talking about the book Undeniable by Douglas Axe, subtitled How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life is Designed, published by HarperCollins in this year. And there's a uh, scan of the book's exterior. Douglas Axe, this is my own summary of his summary of the book, argues that the key to understanding our origins is the design intuition, the innate belief held by all humans that tasks we would need knowledge to accomplish can only be accomplished by someone who has that knowledge. For the ingenious task of inventing life, this knower can only be God. There is science that proves our design intuition is valid. We've seen some and we're going to see some more. Everyday experience can empower ordinary people to defend their design intuition. Living creatures are brilliantly conceived, utterly beyond the reach of accident. Douglas talks about the big question in chapter one. What is the source from which everything else came, or to bring it closer to home, to what or to whom do we owe our existence? And uh, as he says in chapter one, kind of a preliminary summary, we will see in chapter five that the answer we're seeking is not to be found in, uh, not to be found not in technical science, but in something much more familiar something I call common science. There will be plenty of glimpses of technical science along the way, but all of these will be presented with a non-technical reader in mind. In the end, we'll see that mastery of technical subjects isn't at all needed in order for us to know the answer to the big question. Common science will be perfectly adequate. The next section of the book, chapters six through nine, and we're course we're going to be talking about chapter six will be a journey through the important aspects of common science. The point of chapter six will be to provide a better understanding of what life is and what it isn't, which will prove helpful as we progress to the matter of where life came from. So we begin with chapter five, which in my opinion is the central chapter of the book. A dose of common science. Despite the opposition, by 2004, I was confident that I had confirmed Michael Denton's hunch that functional proteins could well be exceedingly rare, 10 to the minus 74. As quoted in chapter three, Denton rec uh, reckoned that accidental processes excuse me, would be incapable of finding new functional proteins if their amino acid sequences were more rare than about one in 10 to the 40th, or one followed by 40 zeros. Having now completed the experiments I described to Alan first and the graduate students in 2002, I was able to put a number on the actual rarity, a startling number. With only one good protein sequence for every 10 to the 74th bad ones, I had found functional proteins to be roughly uh, one followed by 34 zeros fold, more rare than Denton's criterion. Unless this number was overturned somehow, a decisive blow had been dealt to the idea that proteins arose from accidental causes. And remember, it's not just one protein. You have to do it again and again and again for each protein family. Nevertheless, my expectation that this would compel evolutionary biologists to, to hang out of business signs on their doors proved unrealistic. The stream of scientific consensus continued to flow in Darwin's direction throughout 2004, and it still does. I continue to press for the change of thinking I was pressing for then, and this change is as unwelcome now as ever. Real science is nothing like the utopian version I held at the beginning of my journey. The flag of materialized materialism I mentioned in chapter one still prou flies proudly over the academy, and people working under that banner are expected to show due respect. Any serious opposition will bring the color guard out in full force to the sound of blowing whistles. That much is obvious to me. The harder question is how to advance the truth in the face of this opposition. My early recognition of the need to put Darwin's theory to a rigorous technical test compelled me to devote two decades of my career to that need. 
I'm convinced those were years well spent, and yet I've also become convinced of this equally important complementary need. Since most people will never master technical arguments, there is a desperate need for a non-technical argument that stands on its own merits, independent of any technical work. As an expert who has been directly involved in many of the scientific studies derived in, uh, described in the following chapters, I know the conclusions my coworkers and I have drawn are correct, and I know why the good work of others that gets used to argue against our work doesn't support those arguments. I could try to impart this knowledge to readers of this book, I suppose, and one of the things I hope to do after we get done with the book is actually try to impart some of that knowledge. But no matter how many chapters I devote to this, non-experts will still be non-experts after they turn the last page. Does this matter? I'd like to say that it doesn't, and yet I have to admit that it does. I am just one expert among many, most of whom either disagree with my conclusion or are reluctant to admit that they agree. The simple accounts of protein research I give in the coming chapters are therefore sure to be criticized by other experts, which will leave non-experts in the position of trying to figure out which scientists to believe. Now, if Darwin was as wrong as I believe he was, his theory can't possibly be defended as clearly and convincingly as it can be refuted. I will devote a whole chapter to that point. Nevertheless, even poor arguments might seem to benefit from the status of the people making them. When all is said and done, then, non-expert observers inevitably find themselves unable to do anything better with technical debates than trying to follow them and score them. That never settles the matter, though, because being scored the winner of a debate doesn't, isn't the same thing as being correct. For me, there is no debate. The scientific facts are in complete harmony with the universal divine design intu intuition. The work my colleagues and I have done on proteins has completely resolved the internal conflict for me. Resolving the internal conflict for you, however, will require something more. What is needed isn't a simplified version of a technical argument, but a demonstration that the basic argument in its purest form really is simple, not technical. As I thought about how to approach this, it occurred to me that I need to begin by correcting the misconception that science is something most of us will never do. And then he has a box. Because most people will never master technical arguments, there's a desperate need for a non-technical argument that stands on its own merits independent of any technical work. All humans are scientists. We tend to overlook two key facts. One is that everyone validates their design intuition through first-hand experience. The other is that this experience is scientific in nature. It really is. Basic science is an integral part of how we live. We are all careful observers of the world. We all make mental notes of what we observe. We all use those notes to build conceptual models of how things work. And we all continually refine these models as needed. Without doubt, this is science. I've called it common science to emphasize the connection to common sense. We embark on our quest to understand the world at a tender age. Long before we walk, we have constructed simple mental models of gravity and balance. Long before we put our hands to art, we have acquired notions of color, shape, and form. Long before we speak, we have learned to classify things into categories that await the terms we eventually use to refer to them. All of these model building activities and many more use innate mental ability to pro process data, the information we receive from the world by observing it. Of course, we engage in these activities so naturally that we don't think of them in technical terms. My point is that they really are scientific in nature whether or not we think of them in that way. For the most part, professional scientists respect this broadly inclusive view of science. Planetary scientists speak of the sun rising and setting just as the rest of us do. Why? Because those terms represent our common experience more simply and directly than a physically correct description based on the Earth's rotation. Likewise, teachers introduce the technical understanding of sunrise and sunset by connecting it in a clear way to their students' more intuitive understanding. Children are not treated as fools for thinking the sun rises in the east and sets in the west because teachers know prior understanding is crucial to the development of refined understanding. 
The simple model isn't wrong in the sense of giving false predictions, but merely incomplete in that it offers no causal insight. Children readily grasp the more complete model when they see how their simpler model fits within it. This tendency to review prior understanding as a foundation for refined understanding, even in cases where the new replaces the old, continues into adulthood. No teacher of Newton's laws of motion starts by telling students to abandon their prior understanding of how things move. Telling young people who have mastered swimming and cycling and skateboarding that they have no experience of motion or no valid understanding of it would be ridiculous. Just as it would be ridiculous to tell students at the next stage of their physics instruction that everything they learned about Newtonian mechanics is wrong. Everyone seems to recognize that the project of refining understanding presupposes both a general respect for understanding and a humble recognition that it is never perfect or complete. Oddly, these basic courtesies are withheld when it comes to the universal design intuition. The story of Oracle Soup convinced us we all have this intuition, and we now see in simple terms how common science supports it. Bricks and breakfast are made only if someone makes them. We know of no exceptions. With that assurance, we confidently apply these same intuitions, the same intuition to primordial soup, only to be told we're wrong. The people who correct us make no serious attempt to refine the design intuition in order to explain why it would work for one soup but not the other. We're simply expected to ignore the discrepancy. Apparently, our otherwise trustworthy design intuition must be overruled for the sake of Darwin's theory. But intuitions aren't easily overruled. The psychology professors I quoted in Chapter 2, Alison Gopnik and Deborah Kellerman, are acutely aware of this. Their proposed solution is for teachers to begin replacing their students' design intuition with a counterintuitive evolutionary alternative at an early age. As Gopnik put it, the secret may be to reach children with the right theory before the wrong one is too firmly in place. But if the design intuition is a product of common science, then surely to oppose it in the name of science is to make a big mistake. <coughs> Open science. The realization that everyone proves qualified to do science by actually doing science is good news in multiple respects. First, this open view of science dispels the elitist myth I accepted as part of my utopian view of science. We can let that myth go without denying the existence of exceptional talent. The point is that even the most gifted people are still people, prone to all the internal tensions and contradictions that affect all humans. None of us rises above these common imperfections. Max Perutz didn't, and neither does anyone else. Next, open science brings an end to authoritarian science by emphasizing the scientific value of public opinion. Because everyone practices common science, public reception of scientific claims is arguably the most significant form of peer review. For professional scientists to assume that public skepticism toward their ideas can only be caused by public ignorance is just plain arrogant. If ignorance is the cause, clearer teaching should be the remedy. When that proves elusive or ineffective, professional scientists need to be willing to find fault with their ideas, not with the public. This leads to the third piece of good news. Embracing open science empowers people who will never earn PhDs to become full participants in the scientific debates that matter to them. Instead of merely following expert debates, non-experts should expect important issues that touch their lives to be framed in terms of common science. Once they are, everyone becomes qualified to enter the debate. This doesn't apply to intrinsically technical subjects, of course, but the matters of deepest importance on how we live are never intrinsically technical. Truth, plain and simple. According to the universal design intuition, tasks that we would need knowledge to accomplish can be accomplished only by someone who has that knowledge. The observation in the previous chapter that making good enzymes will require a whole new level of insight seems to fit that intuition. Good enzymes come only from insight, and whatever the ingredients of primordial soup might be, insight isn't one of them. The results my colleagues and I have found over many years of working with enzymes also agree with the design intuition. When we examine the proposed ways in which accidental evolutionary processes are supposed to have invented enzymes without insight, we consistently find these proposals to be implausible. 
The key to finding a non-technical path to this same conclusion, I think, is to step back from the experiments that keep showing the implausibility of evolutionary scenarios and ask if there could be a simple reason why this is always so. Surely our immediate sense that instructions can't just surface by accident in alphabet soup is based on some simple sound principle. And surely this same principle, whatever it is, must also explain why the remarkable proteins we call enzymes can't happen by accident. The universal design intuition stated in chapter two is a law of sorts that describes what is impossible. So there must be a simple explanation for why this law holds. The question then is why are tasks that we would need knowledge to accomplish never accomplished without knowledge? The answer to this will become clear over the next four chapters and as expected, common science will be the source. The key point to carry with us is that we shouldn't shy away from affirming the universal design intuition just because it contradicts the scientific consensus. The community of professional scientists is a reliable source for uncontroversial facts, but as we have seen and will continue to see, this community has a habit of stepping well outside that boundary, or at least scientists claiming the authority of this community do. Keep that in mind and remember, People who lack formal scientific credentials are nonetheless qualified to speak with authority on matters of common science. So that is what I consider to be the central part of what he has to say. We'll uh, go on to uh, see some support for that. He talks about life is good. Having established that we're all capable of thinking like scientists and that we can't blindly accept how professional scientists think about life, our next step is to think about how we think about life. Wow factor explains some of life's appeal, particularly in its more exotic forms. But what makes life uniquely attractive to us must be deeper than wow. I believe it's something closer to purpose. Tornadoes rank high on the WOW index because of their enormous power. But while tornadoes do what they do with great intensity, they don't try to do what they do. Spiders, on the other hand, try to catch insects, even as those insects try to escape from their captors' webs. The fear that tornadoes evoke in us is as real as the danger they pose, but the fear of a crouching cougar is palpably different in that it's a fear of harmful intent. There are no mind games to be played with a tornado because a tornado has no mind. Cougars are another matter. Whether the actions of much simpler forms of life, such as the strange morphing of the foraging amoeba, involve awareness at some rudimentary level is anyone's guess. I suspect an amoeba is more like a machine than a cougar in that respect, though possibly very unlike a machine in others. There is at least a superficial resemblance between certain machines and simple forms of life. For example, if I had to pick a kind of machine that resembles amoebas, it would be those creeping robots used to clean swimming pools. Their movements are almost lifelike in their complexity. Pool robots should convince us that a thing need not be conscious in order for us to perceive intent when we observe it. Someone seeing a pool robot in action for the first time would piece together various observations he's making. After watching for a few minutes, aha, that gizmo is cleaning the pool. Meaning, of course, it was meant to clean the pool. The same goes for life, only more so. A child's first experience watching a spider building a web brings particularly excitement at the point where all the little busy movements are seen to add up to a whole design that is visually striking. In this, the child recognizes intent, even if the function of the web remains mysterious. And so do we. The little actions turn out to be significant because they produce a significant end, and we can't avoid the conviction that this was the intended end. The busy little spider was busy for a reason. Activity doesn't always produce that conviction. Sometimes the total effect is just a simple sum of the momentary effects. A little rain on the street produces small puddles, then bigger ones if it continues. But even if the rain continues until the street is flooded beyond use, we aren't left with the impression that the rain or the clouds intended to close the street. Rain gives no appearance of being clever. Rain happens. 
But life doesn't just happen, or at least this is what I hope to convince you of. Life is so different from rain that we will need new vocabulary even to think about it clearly. And he's going to talk about busy holes and hole projects. According to the Oxford Dictionary, is a, a hole is a thing that is complete in itself. Spiders and pool robots are holes in this sense, whereas piles of sand and thunderstorms are not. Conditions that shorten a thunderstorm or actions that divide a sand pile leave us with things that are comparable to the original, though smaller. By contrast, dissection of a spider or disassembly of a pool robot leaves us with remnants or pieces, things that aren't at all comparable to the holes from which they came. The same can be said of a carbon atom or the sun. Both have characteristics that don't come from the simple sum of their parts, although for me the sun, if you take out a piece of the sun, I'm not sure that it makes that much difference. But anyway, yet neither of these objects manifests intent the way a spider and a pool robot do, and with that I would agree. We therefore have in the spider and the pool robot examples of a special kind of hole, the kind that manifests intent by undertaking and completing a project. Before developing this idea further, I should say that the existence of this special class of holes doesn't in any way imply that the things that lie outside it, things like atoms and stars, are unintended or unremarkable. My point is simply that none of these excluded things labors the way a spider or pool robot does or do, as though they had their own intent. We need a term to describe these special holes, the ones that do look as though they're trying to accomplish something. As a simple way of conveying the underlying idea, I'll refer to such things as busy holes. A busy hole, then, is an active thing that causes us to perceive intent because it accomplishes a big result by bringing many small things or circumstances together in just the right way. The big result is also a hole, which we will call a whole project. So busy holes are whole things that tackle whole projects. When we see a finished whole project and recognize it as such, we automatically perceive intent, whether or not we saw how it was accomplished. Two terms that we'll be using, whole project, a big result accomplished by only by bringing many small things or circumstances together in just the right way, and a busy hole, which is an active thing that accomplishes that whole project. Our design intuition offers a clear interpretation of this perception. On recognizing a situation or an object to be a finished whole project, we realize that work was required to bring it to completion. More specifically, we require that skill, uh, realize that skilled work was required, work that brought the right things together in the right way. In our experience, skill always requires discernment, the ability to distinguish the right things from the wrong things and the right way from the wrong way, and discernment in turn requires knowledge. The moment we recognize this, that a project requires knowledge has been completed, we immediately infer that one or more knowers must have been behind the work. This follows naturally from our design intuition. Notice that this reasoning moves from the result, the completed project, to the active thing that did the work. Also notice that knowledge and intent are referred, inferred in a way that doesn't require us to know who, who knew or intended. When we watch a pool robot do its work, we will see that all its little actions added up to a completed whole project, the cleaning of a pool. We know that tackling such projects requires knowledge and that our design intuition tells us there's no substitute for knowledge. But we don't for a moment think the busy hole that did the work, the pool robot, knows anything. Instead, we recognize that the robot is a successful outcome of a much more impressive whole project namely the design and manufacture of a working pool robot. Busy holes tackle their projects by breaking them down into smaller projects in an organized way. These ideas are more familiar than they sound. For example, winning a tennis match may be a whole project for a tennis player. Her success, however, is critically dependent on too many sub-projects for us to list. One, is the transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from her blood, which is a whole project in itself. The busy hole undertaking the top level project, which is playing tennis, is a human being, whereas the busy holes undertaking the 
major physiologic processes supporting the top level projects are systems and organs within her body. In this particular case, the respiratory system. Now, the question that most interests us is whether anyone intended for our lungs and the cells within them to tackle their respective projects the way the tennis player intends to win her match. Are we right to infer purposeful design when we watch the human body or any living body in action, the way we infer it when we watch the pool robot? The answer to this will emerge as we continue, but the, point to, the points to grasp here are more modest. First, rightly or wrongly, we're naturally inclined to think that things like organs and cells were intended. And second, a common sense rationale can be offered for this inclination. Again, whether the rationale I've offered is the one we actually use isn't our concern. Rather, our, concern, our interest is to decide whether the inclinations themselves are correct. As the journey continues, I will build a case for thinking they are correct, but my objective is as much to inspire as it is to convince. If Darwin's theory has left us with an impoverished view of life, as I believe it has, then there is as much to be gained by articulating a more satisfying view of life as there is by showing Darwin was wrong. I hope to do both. Of salmon and orca. I've come to think that everything about a salmon is salmon and everything about an orca is orca. Having worked in molecular biology for decades, I know the similarities between these two aquatic animals are real and significant. And I'm breaking in the middle of a sentence because it takes too much to put it all on one page. But I confess that this head knowledge vanishes when I watch mature salmon, having spent most of their lives in the salty waters of the Pacific, fighting their way upstream through fresh water to reach the place where their lives began. Their mission literally consumes them. Forsaking all food, they sacrifice every ounce of their flesh, launching themselves over and into rocks as they battle their way up up rapids, all for their final purposes of parenting offspring they won't live to see. The salmon's way of passing the baton from one generation to the next may look brutal to us, but their con that concern doesn't seem to have crossed their minds, nor has it crossed mine on the occasions when I've watched them. In their uncompromising determination, these magnificent creatures make it abundantly clear that they're doing exactly what they were meant to do, like heroes and heroines rushing into their last battle. Most of them perished in earlier battles. I spent a day watching this too, with a small group of friends on a whale watching boat in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Orcas, often called killer whales, spend their long lives in family groups called pods. They're the most formidable hunters of the ocean, fearing nothing and feeding on whatever looks good to them, including the otherwise invincible great white shark. Like sharks, orcas kill, but the way orcas kill is altogether different. They're clever and graceful, as greatly to be admired by us as they are to be feared by fish. And he's talking about when he went out to, to see them. It quickly became evident to me that these creatures are smart enough to know they're being watched and gregarious enough to seize any opportunity to show off. As though executing a play from their hunting playbook, they can find the salmon by using a corralling technique where the pod members take up positions around the perimeter of the school to prevent it from dispersing. From our above water vantage point, the signs of this were occasional spouting at some distance from the boat in all directions. These elegant show-offs took turns, swimming at high speed through the trapped school of salmon, gobbling one or two with each pass and celebrating their success with breathtaking high breaches. Five tons of slick black and white launching out of the water with implausible ease. Gravity was repealed for a moment as they took to the air. The thought that this brief spectacle meant quite a few salmon would never make their heroic end-of-life journey only occurred to me later. When it did, the salmon saga again seemed more like valor than tragedy. Orcas are equally compelling in their own distinctive way, and somehow, for me anyway, the fact that part of what it means to be a salmon is to sacrifice you, yourself or some of your relatives to feed the orcas makes neither species less magnificent or less compelling. Life, uh, Darwin. If there's anything compelling about Darwin's view of life, it is the simplicity of his core idea. Underlying the jumble of ideas that evolutionary biology has become is one crisp principle. Things with the ability to reproduce themselves automatically carry the potential to produce descendants that are better reproducers. Few theorized explanations are so disarmingly direct. 
the perpetual improvement of reproduction seems to require only one, that they carry out their reproduction imperfectly, with small errors, mutations, being introduced occasionally, and two, that at least some of these errors enhance reproduction, if only slightly. That is, in one way of saying it, they're not actually errors. The problem with this idea will become clear later. For now, I simply ask how this explanation, if we accept it, ought to shape our picture of life. Considering how innocuous the assumptions appear, the depth of their implications may come as a surprise. We are left to view the many kinds of life much the way we view geological features. As things in constant flux, mountains seem permanent to us because they retain their shape for long periods, yet we know they're constantly being reshaped by the natural forces that form them. The same must be true of life if, like the Earth's crust, it is constantly being molded by unseen forces. By this view, there must have been a simple ancestor of all animals whose offspring were pushed by natural selection in many different directions, like leaves dispersed over waters by, water by convective currents. Modern animals must then be nothing more than the present locations of those drifting leaves. Each is like one frame in a long time-lapse video, the snapshot of the day. The magnitude of the cumulative changes may amaze us as we can contemplate the staggering variety of animals that came from that simple single ancestor. But nothing about the present forms themselves should, be ama should amaze us, as this would be like being amazed by one frame in the middle of a long video. Presumably the descendants of today's spiders and whales and salmon will become as radically different again, given as much time again. Though I personally dislike this fluid view of life, I would have, come, would have come to terms with it if I were committed to the idea of natural selection being life's creator. That wouldn't be easy. I would be constantly bothered by the contradiction between this view and what I see with my, when I open my eyes, because life looks profoundly unlike geology to me. The things of geology are best understood by grouping them into a relatively small number of categories, whereas biology calls for a different approach. Serious pursuit of a satisfying understanding of life's distinct varieties forces us to abandon the idea that they're all fundamentally the same thing. Reproducers stumbling along toward better reproduction. The spider, the salmon, and the orca will have none of that idea. Each is strikingly compelling and complete, utterly committed to being what it is. Each will finish heroically by death or even by extinction, but not by surrendering to forces that would turn it into something else. Perfection and its critics. This theme of commitment takes the idea of holes to a new level by hinting at the possibility that some holes are what they are because they ought to be so, as if they are expressions of something truer and more significant than any temporary physical representation. The idea here is not that some things are so good that they had to exist, but rather that some things are so good that they cannot be other than what they are. The tapestry of human creativity is adorned with several examples, a perfect musical composition, a perfect poem, a perfect mathematical proof, timeless treasures to be beheld but never to be reworked. Now, this is interesting because he'll come later to the fact that evolutionists will use this precise argument. Life is the qu quintessential representation of this idea, utterly without rival among human works. Forget the old textbook definition of life, something to the effect of life being a self-perpetuating, non-equilibrium process based on carbon chemistry and driven by the influx of solar energy. That never resonated with anyone who mused on life. No, life must be something much richer, immeasurably more worthy of our attention. Life is mystery and masterpiece, an overflowing abundance of perfect compositions. You and I are among them, here for a brief time to delight in as many more as we possibly can. Surely everyone senses the profound wonder of life. It seems too overwhelming to be overlooked. Equally obvious is the tension between the sublime view and li of life and the explanation offered by Darwin. His idea that life wanders from one variation to the next, never committing, always yielding to the blind force of natural selection, is plainly incompatible with the idea that the physical form, forms of life are expressions of something deeper, something immovable, something perfect. So how might a person who is reluctant to abandon Darwinism uh, respond to this high view of life? I've seen two approaches. The cruder of the two, and probably the better known, is to downgrade the high view. 
and he mentions things like birth defects and cancer. Um, but my point is more subtle than that. I'm not denying that the present state of life is troubling in many respects. Rather, I'm affirming that something spectacularly good is clearly discernible, even through the haze of trouble. Another way of downgrading life is to assume the role of a biocritic, someone who looks for faults in the design of living things. As one example, the giant panda has a protruding bone in its wrist that serves a thumb-like role, enabling the bear to grasp bamboo. The fact that this bone, called a radial sesamoid, isn't a true jointed thumb like ours has led some people to view it as a makeshift adaptation that no do good designer would employ. For my part, I find myself evaluating the people more than the panda. None of these people have any deep grasp of the principles of design and development underlying sesamoid bones or thumbs, to say nothing of pandas. Indeed, none of us do. Search the world's top research centers and you'll find no skeletal engineers. No one who has the faintest idea how to encase earthworms in exoskeletons or how to endow leeches with backbones. Surely then our total inability to answer these how questions categorically disqualifies us from serious engagement of the higher qu why questions. We're free to form opinions on these matters, but they're nothing more than that. My own opinion for those interested, I, I think that uh, that quote is left in an error. Uh, my own opinion for those interested is that the giant panda is yet another example of something perfect, something that is exact, exactly as it should be. The better option for people who aren't ready to part with Darwin's theory is to embrace life's excellence in the hope that this will ultimately prove explicable in Darwinian terms. This option has a considerable advantage of affirming our high view of life, but with, with that comes the, re the challenge of making a square peg fit a round hole. If natural selection is not just the master shaper, but also the incessant fiddler, as Darwin thought, then evolution would never reach a compelling end. In his own words, it may be said that natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world the slightest variations, rejecting those that are bad, preserving and adding up all that are good, silently and insensibly working whenever and wherever opportunity offers at the improvement of each organic being in relation to its organic and inorganic conditions of life. For Darwin then, the thought of all the various evolutionary lines terminating at ends that are too good to be altered would have been as inconceivable as the thought of unchanging definitions, uh, conditions. Local ecosystems and climates experience one change after another, which means the conditions never settle into a permanent state, which means the, nat the work of natural selection is never finished. And yet you're about to hear that maybe it is. By contrast, the affirmation that there is something uniquely compelling about living things as we now see them is an affirmation of completion. It rejects the idea that the designs of life are like leaves drifting on a pond or like ever-changing mountains or like frames in a video. So followers of Darwin seem to be faced with the dilemma of deciding whether to believe their theory or their eyes. To understand this dilemma more clearly, try to imagine a plausible evolutionary precursor of all modern animals. Among modern animals, sponges come closest to meeting this description. Now, if the anci this ancient sponge really produced the modern orca through long successions of intermediates, we should ask, what drove this astounding transformation of animal form along this particular line of descent? There seem to be only two possible evolutionary answers. Either the conditions of life determined the form, or natural selection did. Both scenarios have issues. If we say conditions are in the driver's seat, then we're saying life is non-committal to the point of incoherence, open to being either a sponge or an orca or any of the subtle gradations supposed to span that not so subtle gap. On the other hand, if we say selection is in control, then we come uncomfortably close to personifying evolution, as though it had been as though it had both the vision to know what it wanted to do with that crude sponge and the patience to walk it through a long period of awkward adolescence, knowing how good the end result would be. Why proteins don't evolve anymore. 
The bigger question, though, is whether life is open to evol evolutionary reshaping at all. The answer that has emerged with the increasing clarity in recent years would have su surprised Darwin. Some of the key facts take us back to the subject of proteins. To, examine, to explain how natural proteins with their exquisite functions could have appeared by accident is a monumental challenge. This challenge can be divided into a more extreme aspect and a less extreme aspect, aspect, both of which are proving to be major obstacles for evolutionary theory. The more extreme challenge is to explain how mutations and selection could have produced completely new structural themes for proteins called folds. <coughs> that is true, at least for the biochemistry. The less extreme challenge is to explain how mutations and selections could have produced functional variations on existing fold themes. My colleagues and I have studied both of these challenges. To focus on the less extreme one, biologist Ann Gager and I chose to work with two strikingly similar yet functionally distinct natural enzymes, which we'll call enzyme A and enzyme B. We've talked about this once before, and we'll talk about it again when we summarize Douglas Axe's work. Our aim was to determine whether it would be possible for enzyme A to evolve the function of enzyme B within a time frame of billions of years. If natural selection really coaxed sponges into becoming orcas in less time, inventing many new proteins along the way, we figured it should have ample power for this small transformation. But after carefully testing the mutations most likely to cause this functional change, we concluded it probably isn't feasible by Darwinian evolution. Additional work supports this conclusion. Mara Claire Reeves, like Ann Gager, a biologist at Biologic Institute, painstakingly tested millions upon millions of random mutations, searching for any evolutionary possibility that we may have overlooked in our first study. She found none. We've received two good questions about this result from non-scientists. The first is how it's even possible to test a process that takes so long. And of course, the answer is you, uh, you test to see how far you get and you multiply it by the time. The second good question is whether scientists who accept Darwin's explanation of life also accept our conclusion that enzyme A can't evolve to work like enzyme B. You may be surprised to hear that many of them do. This after all, is peer-reviewed. In fact, I'm not aware of anyone having challenged that conclusion. Wow. The current answer from evolutionists is that natural selection is a victim of its own success. That is, natural selection is now thought to have been so effective at tailoring organisms to their environments that it did reach endpoints. Darwin would have been horrified. Creatures so good at being what they are that they can no longer undergo evolutionary change. Berkeley paleontologist Charles Marshall exemplifies this perspective. Marshall concedes that experimental alterations of uh, uh, gene regulatory networks um, usually kills developing embryos, but he thinks this should be overlooked because, quote, today's GRNs have been overlaid with half a billion years of evolutionary innovation, which accounts for their resistance to modification. Whereas GRNs at the time of the emergence of the phyla, the basic animal forms, were not so encumbered. The molecular version of that view has become the main criticism of the conclusion I reached with Ann Gager and Mara Claire Reeves. We were wrong, critics say, to expect enzyme A to be capable of further evolution because enzymes like animals have been perfected to the point where they're no longer pliable in the hands of natural selection. Wow. Whether this latest version of evolutionary thinking is any more plausible than previous versions will become clear as we proceed. As he uh, puts it, what's left of a theory of origins once it has been conceded that it doesn't explain how living things originate. We're ready to be, begin scrutinizing the opposite view. If life was not meant to be, then it is accidental, and of the very few suggestions of how it could be accidental, none has more hopes, has had more hopes pinned on it than natural selection. Accordingly, we will use the next chapter to examine natural selection under the powerful lens of common science. Well, my take is, 
I find it fascinating how the argument is evolving. Evolutionists are now conceding that enzymes, GRNs, and animals are incapable of evolving significantly today. They must therefore have reached endpoints. They still evolved. Really? The argument that, that the design is not perfect, that there, therefore there is no design, is still a driving force between the evolu behind evolutionary thought. That's the reason you can't go back to a designer, because the design is not perfect. One final set of questions, and especially on chapter 5, is science simply an extension and refinement of common sense? To what extent should we listen to the experts, and when should we make up our minds with or without their help? What if experts disagree? Can we become experts ourselves? Or, as Doug X, I think, would put it, are we already experts? But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment? He's touched on many different things here. I'm not, I have a, I see just a little bit of a conflict between chapter five and six, in that uh, his arguments in six are above the common level. Yet he feels in chapter five that uh, at the common level, you should be able to um, see design and I have no argument with that statement when I uh, think of a teeny little seed producing a redwood tree uh, to me that's you know it's, that's out of the ordinary uh, and so on uh, but he went into fairly technical stuff here that towards the end of chapter six uh, I, I think uh, I like his argument in five. Uh, when an ovum and a sperm, you know, that's microscopic can produce an elephant, uh, this is worthy of a certain amount of respect and something a, a person can understand without knowing all about uh, how complicated proteins are and uh, and they're getting to be more and more complex as we have, as we study more and more. So uh, I like his uh, idea of five that uh, there is a science tells us a science. A person can be a scientist. I, we all have to. I mean, you have to agree. Common sense tells us no. There, there's. Uh, there's something here we don't need to get into all this technicality. Uh, but I appreciate uh, what he said in six because you know the, the technicality is, seems more significant to me than the common thing. But both are both are saying the same message, giving the same message that hey, uh, how could this all get together here now? How could a, a seed produce a redwood tree? Uh, we don't see it happening normally, uh, and we can't do things like that ourselves, and so on. Uh, the uh, design of nature idea seems to be rather obvious there. Uh, I'm just going to throw in another idea here. Uh, it seems to me that uh, part of the problem and uh, you know, natural selection is that that's been a, a wonderful deception because uh, people hear about natural selection. It's an easy thing to understand. Hey, things are getting better, and so on. And we stop right there without realizing, hey, uh, this thing doesn't work at all. 
when you get into complex structures and advancement of design. Uh, with that, with that in mind, you wonder why has the intellectual community of the world as a whole bypassed all this and accepted accepted something that doesn't work. And that gets into a different question he's not addressing, but I think it is a very vital and important question here is why is why is uh, society as a whole they believe in evolution and so on and yet we all have that that uh, intuition if you want to to use his term uh, this doesn't work. Uh, tribalism sets in in society, and uh, when you have tribes, uh, then you've got uh, problems. And I would attribute this to a certain extent to to, to tribalism. Now, I, I uh, that gets into sociology, and I'm not a sociologist, but. I, I would say that uh, it's it's more than just intuition here. It's human behavior hmm. uh, uh, that is involved in, in this the fact that the majority of the intellectual community of the world and those who aren't also have accepted evolution. So I'm not raising a question. I'm just just these are just my comments to this thing. I think one of the major questions he was trying to pose in these chapters was, how does somebody with common science and how does an ordinary person like most of us are, how do you decide among the experts? And this became very clear to me when I was teaching graduate students because we'd have long lists of people in, in one camp or another. There were the Marxists, there were the Hegelians, there were the John Deweyans, there were the, the various groups of people with varying ideas about things. And students like it when you say, this is what is true and this will be on the test. And I refused to give tests that had that kind of an answer because I wanted them to think about it themselves. And so I would say, so Dr. Wise person says this is true, how do you know it's true? Where, how did you get to the point where you are today? And what is it you're going to teach your students when you get out there? Because there are many, many Dr. Wise persons around, and we can all remember at the beginning of our higher education trip when suddenly here was Dr. Wise person, and we're so overwhelmed by this person. And in undergraduate school, students have a hard time getting beyond Dr. Wise person said to yeah, but it doesn't look like true to me. And I am going to study on my own to try to figure it out. And I, that's what I think he's trying to encourage here, is don't take anybody's word for it without trying to figure it out for yourself, because they might be wrong. One of the pr things that has troubled me about higher education are little enclaves of the intellectuals. The intellectuals? Aren't we all intellectuals in some sense? Are there people are. <laughs> are there people out there that we can now look to them because they are the scientists, they are the intellectual, they are the theologian, they have the answers? How do you know? It's in, it was interesting to me in one of the recent classes that I taught. Somebody brought up the point, I, I was talking about some area which I escapes me at the moment. The response troubled me though, because this person said, in effect, oh, you're, you're gonna take anything that comes out of Nazareth? Only they used the town, a town in California. You're gonna believe anything that comes out of Nazareth? I thought, seriously? That's your best argument against what I have to say? So my response was, how do you know they're wrong? How did the people in Jesus' time know he was wrong? Or how did they know he was right? I think that's what the point he was trying to make in chapter 5. Just in commenting on that, it, it seems to me that uh, 
one of the richest and most important things we can pass on to ourselves and others is to be a little more critical than we are. I, I, I'll admit, when I, when I hear a, a bright person talk, I tend to believe what he says. I, when I hear a person say, hey, look at all the mathematical formulas I've tacked onto this thing, uh, I've learned to be a little more careful about that because people use mathematics as an excuse to sophisticate stuff that's very simple and often wrong. Uh, anyway, that's, I think we need to be more, more, a lot more critical than we are. We have a problem, and the reason why we have a problem is because we have not learned <clears throat> the rightful place for trust. Now, you see the problem with trust. The moment you even raise the, the, the word trust, you immediately feel like, ah, ah, uh, who? Or what do I trust? You see, that's an issue. The, the problem with that is that we can talk ourselves into trusting a really bad bill of goods and talk ourselves out of trusting a really good set of goods. And a dog could tell the difference, and we can't. And why is that? Ah, you see, the dog uses a wider range of information sources than merely <laughs> the point of whether somebody standing in front of him is smart or not. The dog also asked a simple question, do I know this person? But he doesn't ask it, oh, wait a minute, wait, I have to ask this question. No, it's automatic, it's implicit, it's intuitive. A stranger is not trusted. Somebody the dog knows is trusted. Why? Because you have a relationship. You have experience developed along those lines. Yes? Okay. Now, we come face to face with a simple point. Why do we have trust in the first place? Why can't we just say, well, I'm not going to trust anything until I learn enough, until I have enough experience to know who I can trust and who I cannot trust. Yes? But, but you see, this is a vicious cycle here. You, you can't start that way. The whole point of trust is to bridge the gap where there is no knowledge. You see, we trust our eyes to begin with. We trust our noses, we trust our tastes, our whatever senses that we have, because they have served us well in the past, and we think they will serve us well today too. Without trust, in fact, it is not even possible to have any learning at all. Because you cannot even trust your own mind that you're making sense. You see, there is a problem here that we have. How do and, we and get... And furthermore, in science, yes. you can't trust what's in the textbook. You can't trust what the teacher is saying. Uh, Pretty soon. At some point, you have to... Yeah, yeah. You have to exactly. put down roots. You have to... You have to and ask the scary us. part of it is, it is always yes. possible to be wrong. Uh, absolutely. 
Um, I used to think that emergency medicine exemplified life in this way, that, that our job is to make decisions and act upon them based upon incomplete and inaccurate information. Absolutely. The history we get, the physical we check ourselves, <laughs> um, this, the, the background knowledge that we have yes. could be wrong. Absolutely. In some cases, has been wrong in the past, and we've had to reform it. Uh, in, and yet, somehow we manage that uh, all the way through. In fact, I would go one step further. Without trust, life itself is not possible because no learning is possible. But and if life cannot learn, it cannot adapt, it cannot adjust to whatever is happening around it. But Danilo... It Yes. You know that textbooks are written by committees and that textbooks change all the time. And what is true in the textbook this year was written seven years ago, and we now know from the newspaper that the textbook is wrong. We cannot, without <laughs> critical thinking, trust a textbook. <laughs> that but we are forced to trust other people. Well, that, that's we, my point about emergency medicine. We, we, you're either going to give the drug or you're not. Right. You, you can't repeat all the experiments. No, I you mean, can't repeat all the experiments. You can't, you, can't, you can't even read them carefully enough to, well, did I miss something here? Uh, I mean, certainly you could have a, a year ago, but now with 20 minutes to decide which way you're going to go, there's no way you can go back to the origin and, and, and rehash all of the questions all over again. You can't. But, but uh, well, there's certain areas. For instance, uh, there, there are certain uh, areas in, the, uh, in paleontology where they've identified and named characteristics that were important and those corrections characteristics were selected on the basis of the position of that fossil at a certain level. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, it was allowed to, evolutionary advancement was allowed to determine what was important. That whole area of science needs to be re-evaluated by somebody who doesn't make a premise that, hey, we're going to allow uh, evolution to decide which characteristics are important so we get an evolutionary sequencer. Yes, and uh, the question that I have now is, how long will that ev uh, evaluation take? It take many lifetimes. Okay, so are so we going to be able do? to manage that now? No, I just say, those guys are wrong. <laughs> I settled it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, Doug. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to point out that, I, that really fascinating concept brought up about, um, you know, basically everybody's a scientist, you know, just naturally, kids are that way. Um, and sort of this idea, I think it could be very popular and have a lot of room for growth and utility, and, and that is that, you know, let's build upon the science that people naturally have, the scientific ability that people naturally have. Um, you know, I, I think that citizen science is, is a popular thing, you know, it, that's, that's being encouraged. Um, but I think, on the other hand, there's sort of a, well, that's to go ahead and get involved in, like, you know, uh, you know science that the experts are helping you to get involved with. Like, say, for example, uh, looking at the galaxies or something called Zooniverse, and, and you can go online and you become a citizen scientist by looking at the images and being able to say, you know, categorize these, these things and participate in science. It seems to me as though it could be a lot broader than that uh, and, um, and perhaps even helping people to, to uh, sort of capitalize on their scientific abilities with maybe a, a basic training to be able to help people to, to reason and evaluate the things that cross their paths. Uh, I would say, for example, when I read a news item, uh, I find myself uh, sometimes, you know, doing my own research and finding out, you know, I, 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 
see it, something doesn't seem quite right, I do a little evaluation, maybe use a little basic math to be able to find out is it likely that this, what they're saying is true or not. Uh, it's usually when I think it's not true that I uh, investigate. You know, I think people should do stuff like that uh, to, to think for themselves and employ what scientific abilities they have to be able to, uh, to do that. And I think that would be good for society uh, to do that. Um, the second thing is um, this idea of evolution having reached an end point. Uh, you know, enzymes, you know, cannot evolve further. Uh, to what extent, extent is that idea generally held and, and also to what extent is it believed that it, uh, how broadly in, in the different fields of science does it apply? Yeah. For example, uh, I think, you know, maybe it might be considered that dragonflies, maybe they cannot evolve, but I, I would be surprised to, to learn that most biologists, evolutionary biologists also feel that's true for, for other, you know, mammals, for example. Do you know? Well, you know, I think that there's, it's an interesting evolution that's taking place. And, <laughs> pardon <laughs> the expression. Right. Um, and that is, you started out with Darwin's theory. And, of course, Darwin, the instinctive thing to say is, well, who's to say we're stopped now? You'd expect us to continue to evolve. Okay, what's happening is that with the, the data that are being put out, it's becoming increasingly evident that we're not evolving, that we can't evolve. And so the easiest thing to say is, well, it must have happened in the past, but it's not happening now. So now what we're, what we're seeing is people abandoning the Lyellian principle of uh, the, we seek, causes in the past that are presently active because now we don't see it active but it must have been there in the past and I think what we're seeing is a, a progressive iteration of evolutionary uh, biology or maybe what I should say is in in one sense a regressive iteration that is to say it's having to abandon a major premise that it had in the past. But, I mean, uh, there, it seems though there are examples of, of for example, development of uh, resistance to antibiotics. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it seems to me as though microevolution, I think there is, there is real evidence for that. Um, but, you know, that one enzyme cannot evolve to a second you know, the function of a second enzyme, I mean, that's like, you, you got to have evolution, you, you got to have that for evolution. Well, it depends on the distance. Right. right. And, and if the distance is two mutations, it actually can evolve and can evolve within a person's lifetime. Uh, the best examples that I can think of are chloroquine resistance and nylonase production. It takes two, en two enzyme or two, two key mutations in order to get from uh, uh, a, an amidase that let's say specifically works on oh, glutamine or asparagine or something like that uh, or perhaps proteins to be able to to hit nylon instead, and basically, what uh, you know, it takes it takes, and and it, once you get there, you can refine it a little. But the idea is that it takes only a certain amount of of change, and that change can actually be reapproached randomly. Now, if you're going from producing biotin to producing, and I'm trying to think of what the other what the other one is, um, the, the A and B enzymes that they were talking about, it takes seven changes. Mm. That's not going to happen in our, in our lifetime. As a matter of fact, because of the random walk nature of the problem, 
it's not going to happen in the lifetime of our planet. Even if you consider the lifetime to be 4 billion years, it's just not going to happen. And people are starting to realize that, and that's why they're coming up with this, well, the original enzyme was actually kind of a hybrid, and it wasn't differentiated, and it did both, or something like that. Is because there's just too much of a gap between the two enzymes to really make it work. So, but is, but is that, is that fact generally known? Um, amongst let, scientists. Let me put it this way. It's generally known among the experts. The experts aren't advertising it because they don't have a good answer for it. Right. And the, you're being educated to start with in the accepted belief system. Then after you become an expert in the ex accepted belief system, then they'll throw at you these hard problems. It, it's, it is very much like what some of us do is we learn about, let, let's say the Sabbath, and we learn about the rationale for it. And then maybe uh, after we've accepted it for a while, people will bring up, well, what do you do with Colossians 2.16? Or what do you do with Galatians 4.10? Uh, or, or Romans, is it 14? Uh, the hard texts then start coming out. Um, I'm not criticizing them specifically for doing this because it's a way most people teach, including us. But I am saying that sooner or later one needs to deal with that and that the knowledge that there are these problems should give people pause about proclaiming with too much absolute certainty that they've got it right and that the other guys are totally wrong and that there's no reason for the other guys to even have their position, which is how it's being portrayed. Right now, intelligent design is being kept off with a ferocity that would be more appropriate, actually, in a funny sense, it's less appropriate uh, than the way scientists treat astrology. And I think that the reason why is because Christianity is more of a threat than astrology is to science, to science in the sense of the current scientific consensus. That what's really happening is that they can afford to kind of blow off astrology. Because if you and I go into it, we, we realize very rapidly that what's being portrayed is either truisms or dichotomies that, yeah, you can find yourself in, in, in maybe and maybe not. And um, the hit rate is approximately 50%, uh, excluding the truisms. Uh, and, and uh, you know, in 50%, well, you might as well toss a coin. You do as well. And, and in fact, scientists don't even worry about it. But if somebody were to push it, I would argue that scientists should do very much like what they did on Laetrile. It was very interesting. Scientists argued, no, you can't do this. It's immoral. It's uh, especially physicians. You can't. And then, and then somebody said, you know, this is not gaining any traction. The longer we fight this, the longer we say, keep it out of medicine, the worse it's getting. Tell you what, let's just do it. Let's do an experiment. And everybody who goes into the experiment will know what it is. And uh, presumably people who don't want to be a guinea pig, don't have to be. People who think, well, maybe it's a toss-up, then they can go in. People who need their lay trail don't have to go in either. But basically, you try people who could be open to either side, and you try people who, uh, investigators who are willing to approach it as a, as a possibility. 
And when they did that, they got a negative result. And suddenly the whole thing mostly drew, dried up and blew away. And see, that's the way you should settle these things. But it's not the way it's happening. Go, go ahead and comment. The reason is? What's the reason? Well, the reason is, I think, that these people are afraid that it might come out positive, and then they would have to reverse their uh, opinions. That's what I think, but your, your mileage may vary on that. C could you tell us a little bit about Laetril? Oh, Laetril is, was a popular um, cure for cancer at one time. And it was made from apricot uh, seed pits, and among other things, it had a significant quantity of cyanide in it that could be hydrolyzed and, and uh, uh, was damaging to some cells. And of course, some people would say, oh, well, that, you know, that'll never work. And other people would say, oh, that's the mechanism by which it works, is it, it kills the cancer cells and leaves the regular cells alone. And you know, before you say too much about uh, that's total nonsense, but wait a minute, we use poisons of various kinds for cancer all the time anyway. And you know, some make your hair fall out and some of them give you nausea, vomiting and diarrhea and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, you know, the best way to find out is to try it. And, and in fact, I'm going to propose that that is really what we need in this whole question that we're dealing with. That that if you want, uh, I don't care about who the person is who makes a claim. How many PhDs he or she has, how long he's worked in the field, whether he's got a Nobel Prize. What I want to know is, what is the rationale and has anybody tested it? And if the question is, well, we haven't actually tested it, then let's get to doing it. It's one of the reasons I really appreciate Doug Axe and his approach, because he did, in fact, test a bunch of stuff. And he tested it in such a way that before people realized where this was leading, they didn't have any choice but to accept his, uh, his published results. I mean, it was so bad that they couldn't even get rid of him with peer review. He published in 2000, he published in 2004, and both in respected journals, and nobody has been able to really gainsay what he had to say. And see, that's why I'll listen to Doug Axe. It's not that he has a PhD. Lots of people have PhDs. He specifically worked in this particular area and did experiments that A, came out his way, and B, nobody has been able to make them come out the other way. And you know, somebody says, well, he's wrong. Well, he probably is. Maybe it's 10 to the uh, 74th instead of uh, 10 to the 75th instead of 10 to the 74th or 10 to the 73rd. It doesn't matter. <laughs> They're both way out there. And, and so, uh, you know, if I want to hear somebody complaining about what he did and saying that what he did was a bunch of hooey, I want to know, well, have you done any experiments? And if the answer is no, I don't care how many PhDs, I don't care how many Nobel Prizes you won. You don't actually have the experience to, to, to dispute him. And uh, now, reasoning power is something that all of us can have. And maybe some of us are better than others at it. Um, but, 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 what I want you to do is I want you to give me reasoning power that I can follow. Two persons in this point, in their recent history, uh, have influenced more people perhaps than anyone else. And these two are uh, Adolf Hitler 
and Darwin. Uh, to me, I feel that they're saying, if you tell a big lie, often enough, people will believe. And that's how Hitler worked. And that's how Charles Darwin, whether Charles Darwin really knew about it or not, I'm not sure, but maybe he was convinced that what he's telling is the truth. But uh, this is how it worked, though. I think there's one more thing. It helps to tell a lie that appeals to something inside of them. And I think that this is, uh, right. this is the key. It's not just any old lie that you tell. It's one that grabs them yes. in the emotional area. If you really, if you really want to make the big lie stick, make it something that is innately attractive. You know, I don't think that, uh, yeah, th that yeah, all true. of these people, and particularly I doubt that Darwin, sat down and carefully calculated, well, which lie should I tell? In fact, I think that he probably believed his own propaganda, so which right. makes it more convincing if you try to sell it to somebody else. Uh, but, but if I am trying to explain to you why you should listen to me instead of Joe Blow, it's because I'm reasoning clearly enough that you can follow the reasoning. And at certain points, we have tested those 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 arguments against the arguments from various other sides that one could take and say if they their theory predicts a our theory predicts b we did the experiment and b came out on top and that's where the real authority comes it's not from the textbooks it's from the the logic behind uh, behind what's being said and the experimental results that test that logic and test those uh, uh, those theories. Sometimes the results are man are manipulated too. Yes, but the, there is the, um, the the issue of the judgment day has bothered me for a long time and for the following reason. All the information is presented, yet there are no conversions. Why is that? Now that everything is revealed, that's the whole point of the judgment day, to reveal everything that was hidden. And maybe that's part of the point, is that the reason, I, the reason I said that you want to make a lie that actually grabs people where they're thinking is because that's what you're really trying to look at. Uh, that when, uh, when one person uh, starts to believe um, something what they it chooses to believe something that doesn't really have that much evidence behind it, but happens to fit a particular belief system or a particular way of looking at things. Then that's when God can say, "Look, they're not believing because of the information." They're believing because, in fact, they want to believe. And if what you want to believe falls in the nature of, uh, well, in, in the, kind of the bottom line, what we heard in, in church this morning, which was um, everyone has value and whenever you see that you can do some good, you try to do it. Not because God demands it, but because it's what you do. That God can say, this is a person that I can work with. This is a person that's safe to, to turn loose for eternity. 
Whereas, if, however enlightened it seems to be at the time, your question is, what about self-interest? Sooner or later, that self-interest will appear to contradict the interests of others. And if you're going to go your own way at that point, you will be fooled into doing something that is horribly wrong. You will be self-fooled into doing something that is horribly wrong. And that, I think, is, you know, the, it, it covers the question of judgment, and it also covers the question of what and who should we believe now. Are they appealing to our baser instincts, or are they appealing to something that is more, uh, something that is more uh, kind, loving, whatever you want to call it? As a believer, I can't help but see that the devil in his great wisdom and experience invented a most fantastic theory and helped people to believe it. And the implications of that theory? The implications of that theory. Well, people believed a lie. And maybe we need to do some teaching and, otherwise. And among other things, believe that they were only animals. <laughs> okay. But, but it's, it's all involved. What is all involved in this is uh, it's a matter of belief, faith, God versus evil. Yeah. Well, I think with that, we will just call it a day. Next week, come by and we'll take some more look at the word? book. Uh, 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 what is it? Un Undeniable, which is, I'm sorry, my age is catching up with me. <laughs> so come on back and we'll, uh, we'll look some more.